Okay, so what we're going to do is finish this uh, EDM, electro discharge machining, and I will switch after I finish EDM, before doing the laser class and laser machining, I will do the photolithography class. Why I'm doing that is for two reasons. I need to introduce some equations we need for laser machining, which are the same equations that we have in the lithography class. So that's one reason. The second reason is, in a moment, you will see that you can do EDM with parts that are made, tools that are made with LIGA. And LIGA is a photolithography technique. LIGA stands for, so write it down, L-I-G-A. It's lithography, galvanierung und abformung. And that means, Adrian? Oh, the eye parts? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just pulling your leg. So LIGA. Lithography, galvanierung is the German word for electroplating. And A, abformung, is molding. And so it's a fascinating new manufacturing technique, very, very advanced. But you need to know lithography before you can understand the concept. So we set, we know what we're doing today, finishing up EDM, right, and then lithography. So quite a bit of material to cover today. So I'm not going to go to laser beam machining. I'm just going to finish off the first part there. We, of course, know that EDM, just like laser machining, is a thermal technique. We saw the movie. In the movie, we saw two types of EDM. You remember which two types? Two big categories. Go ahead. With wire cutting, eh? so very big difference. Uh, in EDM, sinker EDM, we have this one tool that you sink into your workpiece. In the case of EDM, we have this wire that can give you much, much more flexibility in making pretty much any 3D shape you want. Hmm? So this was wire, sorry, this is uh, sinker EDM. This gives a little bit more detail. So key parts in electro-discharge machining in the sinker mode is a power supply. Then you have your work tool. The EDM machine holds that complementary part to what you're going to cut out of the workpiece. And the workpiece and tool is embedded in a dielectric fluid. Oil or water, DI water, cannot be conductive. You remember we're going to create a plasma, microplasma, in that little gap between the tool and the workpiece. And that little spark, plasma, is very conductive, heats up very, very fast, because there's a current now flowing there, and it melts or evaporates the metal underneath. And you make many, many, many of these little sparks per second. Right? So a small DC bias is applied till that gap of dielectric breaks down, it's like a capacitor breaking down. And when you have that breakdown spark, that's what causes the machining. One thing that we already know in this case, you can only use this machining for what kind of materials? They will have to be conductors, right? So that's already kind of a big, big restriction. It's a major technique used for creating molds, we will see. Once we go into injection molding, you know, not making these parts like you have done with 3D printing, but it, in traditional injection molding, you need to make a metal mold. And this technique is a major way to go about that. So a few characteristics that we didn't cover, but kind of summarizing from the movie. So during normal operation, the electrode, here, this part, never touches the workpiece, but is separated by a small spark gap. The electrode plunger can be a complex shape and can be moved in the X, Y, and Z axis. If you do do that, you're talking about CNC EDM, right? If the only thing you can do is come down, that's not CNC, right? That's just plain plunger EDM. But if you can operate it in X, Y, and in the Z direction, that will be CNC EDM. The spark discharge or pulse on and off at a high frequency with a cycle and in a cyclic mode, and it can repeat up to 250,000 times per second. By the way, the faster you do it, the smaller the sparks and the finer the cut will be. 
but it will take longer. If you make bigger sparks, you will cut faster but rougher. The surface will not have the polish you want it to have. Each discharge melts or vaporizes a small area of the workpiece surface. Plunge EDM is best used in tool and die manufacturing or for creating extremely accurate molds for injection molding plastic, as I was referring to a moment ago. And the last bullet point, kind of self-evident, the amount of material removed from the workpiece with each pulse is directly proportional to energy contained in that pulse. So nothing new from what we saw in the movie and talked about yesterday. This slide summarizes a little bit of why is that dielectric there. And probably even without reading the bullet points, you can come up it with it yourself. What would be the functions of that dielectric, the DI water of the oil? What will it do? Major roles. Flushing the debris away, right? Mm -hmm. Cooling. And of course, it's also the medium that allows you to create a spark. Right? Let's see if it covers each of these points I just made. It acts as an insulator until sufficiently high potential is reached at what point we have a breakdown. Acts as a coolant medium and reduces the extremely high temperature in the arc gap, right? Second point. And then thirdly, the dielectric fluid is pumped through that small gap and it flushes away the debris. Last bullet point, and I'm going to connect this with, to my question that I had for you earlier on the acoustic machining. You remember, still need to figure why, in that case, your tool is consumed slower than your workpiece. Same question I'm going to ask you guys here. So by now, someone is keeping track. You're keeping track of the questions, right? That's going to be your fifth question. Because you could again ask, you know, I'm sparking in that gap. So why is one side the workpiece and the other one the tool? Why isn't it reversed, right? Some of you, in the case of the acoustic machining, has given me already the right answer. Uh, but I think about 40% of you know the answer there. Remember, the word was what? Starts with a D and a U. OK, so shh. <laughs> and so we also will have similarly have to come up with an answer. Why is it here that the workpiece and the tool could not be inverted? Right? So a relatively soft graphite. Here we go. You could actually, in this case, I'm even pushing my luck. In this case, it's actually quite a soft material that could really machine very hard materials, hard metals. We can use uh, soft graphite or a metallic electrode. Can easily machine hardened tool steels, even tungsten carbide. Hmm? And that's one of the many attractive benefits of using EDM. Here you can see, if you use a CNC EDM, you do not just make a hole downwards. Because if I have the XY direction, I can start making with a circular tool, I could make an oval. Right? Or in the case of a square tool, I can make steps because I can move in the XY direction now. So stepped cavities produced with a square electrode by EDM. The workpiece moves in the two principal horizontal directions and its motion is synchronized with the downward direction. So also as shown, there's a round electrode here capable of making ovals. For those people that know a little bit about research in my group, we have recently been approached for making carbon electrodes for EDM. Why? One of the things we do in my group is called carbon MEMS. In a moment, when I start talking about lithography, you will see that I'm patterning a polymer. Hmm? I couldn't use a polymer for EDM, right? But we have invented a technique that when we have that polymer shaped by lithography, I can convert it into carbon by a process called pyrolysis, carbon carbonization. So any complex shape that I can pattern lithographically, I can translate in carbon. And then with my carbon electrode, I could make the most sophisticated EDM out there. There's actually a lab in Germany now trying out some of our carbon mem structures to use them for EDM. And because I can make my electrodes now so small, because I'm using lithography techniques, I can do what we call micro-EDM. And that's what I'm going to talk about in a couple of slides from now. Micro-EDM meaning, well, that's still a big tool, right? But suppose I want to make something of one or two microns. We already know 
that workpiece itself, there's no way I could make this mechanically, right? And so the technique that we're proposing is this carbon MEMS. So I'll write that down, I will come back to it later. So a few more concluding remarks about sinker EDM. The sur surface finish is affected by the gap voltage, discharge current and frequency. I told you so, if the frequency is higher, you have smaller sparks, you make the gap smaller, also smaller sparks, and you will have a finer finish. The EDM process can be used on any material that's an electrical conductor, important, right? Uh, the EDM process does not involve mechanical energy, obviously it's a thermal technique, therefore materials with high hardness and strength can easily be machined. And applications include producing die cavities uh, for large components, we talked about that already, right, molds, deep small holes, complicated internal cavities. EDM is not a fast method and some jobs can take days to produce holes, so it's used in a limited amount of jobs that can, so you don't use it if it can easily be done in another way. <laughs> Makes sense, right? So note uh, too that the work must be conductive so it does not work on materials such as glass and ceramic. I'm being repetitive here. What do you call glass? Uh, no, it's at an angle. Oh. Uh, now that table here, you don't need to memorize that, but it gives a little bit of a summary on what you can do with sinker EDM. So the tool is carbon, zinc, brass, soft materials, right? Dielectric medium, medium is typically DI water. Other people use oil. Key is an insulator, right? You can make aspect ratios of holes as high as 100 to 1, so making deep holes is indeed a good technology here. Surface finish, 1 to 3 microns, but even 0.25 microns have been reported, and that will depend on these settings, right? So very small sparks, uh, very high frequency, very small gap, you will have a very small finish, maybe as good as 0.25 microns. Then the gap size slash voltage, we are talking about 80 volts over 25 micrometer. So uh, you're going to calculate us what that means? Tim, what's the electrical field? <laughs> Easy one, right? And then the workpiece needs to be conductor. So how big is the electrical field? What do you think? Because we need to have a field that's big enough to cause dielectric breakdown. Now, so in air, for example, if you have a spark in air, how much, what do you think, what kind of the fields do you need for that? Any field for that? Like if you have a capacitor with an oxide layer, or we're talking about what kind of voltages and fields we're talking about before you get breakdown? Any, any field for that? How much? Kilovolt. It'll be more like 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7th volt per centimeter. So these are, <laughs> right, big, big voltages, very strong fields before you get that breakdown to occur. So now this field has been moving, and it has been moving in kind of two directions. One is making the machine itself much smaller. Here you see uh, this man in Panasonic, he's actually the inventor uh, of this device. He has an EDM that you can hold in your hand. So that you could call that micro-EDM, but you can also mean micro-EDM if what you're making are very small parts. So it goes two ways. Hmm? So when referring to micro-electrical discharge machining or micro-EDM, one refers either to working with a small EDM, so the man here at Panasonic holds one of uh, those in his hands, or to working with smaller than usual electrodes. In the case of sinker, EDM, or with thinner wires, of course, in the case of wire cutting EDM, right? To make smaller things in wire cutting, you need a thinner wire to make smaller items. So that is micro EDMs. So now we kind of come already to this issue, how do I make smaller tools? Yeah, because you always have to start from somewhere. You can do all of that fancy EDMing to make a mold, but you have to start by machining your tool. And so now, especially when we want to make these tools small, let's say two or three mm -hmm. microns, how do we do it? So here you see on the right a bunch of examples. 
of EDM structures that have been done, fabricated by that LIGA process I was alluding to. And so LIGA is a lithography process. That's why the rest of this class, after finishing this, I'm going to introduce you photolithography so you can appreciate what LIGA is. Because with LIGA and lithography in general, we can actually make much smaller structures you can do than mechanically, and you can make arrays of them. Because as you will appreciate, photolithography can make things in batch. So rather than making one tool, I could make, as you have done there, as we've seen on the left, I make maybe 100 by 100 of these posts. In that case, these are metal posts. And so in Liga, what you have done there to make an array of metal posts, you've done lithography, you've done electroplating, and the electroplate, and then it stops in that case. You don't do abformum, you don't do molding. So we created hundreds of nickel electrodes to do the machining. And we've done it with a precision that's only achievable with lithography. Now, there's no way that with CNC machining you could carve out that forest of posts, right? So now what you do with these posts, you do the EDM process, just like we've learned, and what you make is literally bunches, arrays of holes. Holes that are maybe three microns in size. There's no way you could do that with traditional EDM, right? There you're talking about three millimeters, four millimeters, so we really have gone down by at least three orders of magnitude in size. Hmm? Uh, other electrodes that have been made are shown at the bottom. So in a way, with lithography, we'll see in a moment, pretty much anything you can imagine, you can make. Right? And you can make it first in a polymer, and then you can electroplate it, so you have the negative of that in metal. And then you could go one step further. You could use that metal as a mold. And voila, you have liga. So you've done it all, right? Patterning, photoresist, electroplating, molding. That's liga. So the use of microelectrode arrays enables one to use micro-EDM in batch mode. That was pioneered by Takahata uh, from Japan. Uh, and you can see that it's become batch now, right? Because I use lithography, which is in batch, means many things all in parallel. You can make these small structures with EDM now also in batch, because your electrode creates many, many features all at the same time. So to do that, he employed that LIGA process, and LIGA will explain more in detail. Structures made with this hybrid LIGA EDM method are shown in the figure on the right. And so the, the last bullet point is carbon MEMS as electrodes. So while I'm explaining the lithography class, I will tell you this will allow me to make LIGA electrodes for EDM and carbon electrodes for EDM. So connect these two to the lithography class. Hmm? Okay. The other technique we saw in the movie, and is the other more novel trend in EDM, is this wire EDM. If you didn't see the wire well enough in the movie, uh, this is a good picture here. So you see that rectangular slab of material, that's the workpiece. And it's again, like before, embedded in a dielectric. And you can see I have a wire supply reel and I have a take-up reel. And so that wire, in this case, is running from the top to the bottom. It keeps on renewing itself and you spark so you apply a voltage between that wire and your workpiece. So the mechanism, the physics, is all the same as with a single EDM. But in this case, I don't need a fixed tool, do I? Because the tool is created by the path my computer tells the wire to take. So that is a maskless or tool-free, they call that free-form machining, right? Because if I program the wire to do this, it'll create that. With the previous technique, I needed to make a certain shape, and then that shape would be translated in the workpiece. Very different. Hmm? So electrical discharge machining, or wire cutting, EDMWC, is a thermal mass reducing process, subtractive, that uses a continuously moving wire, so that, to remove material by means of a rapidly controlled repetitive spark discharge. Same physics. A dielectric fluid is used to flush the 
the removed particles away to regulate the discharge and keep the wire and workpiece cool. The wire and workpiece must be electrically conductive. Of course, that remains the same, right? It's an electrical technique causing heat by the current that goes between the two parts. On the right, a bunch of structures made that way. And you can see how complex they can be. You can run one of these wires for about 50 hours, then you throw them away. Hmm? They can be copper wire, for example. And of course, as we said, if you want to make smaller, finer features, you'll have a thinner wire. So as much as 50 hours of machining can be performed with one reel of wire, which is then discarded. And this is nothing else than yet another rendition of the same picture you saw before. So here is the workpiece. This is the wire cutting a certain part, and here you have your dielectric supply spraying onto the site where you do the sparking, where you do the machining. And now the type of things that people have been able to make with this is actually quite, quite amazing. Uh, this doesn't give you too much more information. It tells you that you can make complex 3D shapes. You already got that. Must be performed on electrical conductive workpiece. Dielectric fluid, we need to be there, so that's kind of repetitive, right? I don't think there's any new information on this here. Uh, no, the new information is perhaps uh, specifying that gap between the, the wire and the workpiece, which is a thousandth of an inch. But a very nice application that was developed again in Japan, and I believe by the group who invented this technique, Takahata, uh, is by using this head here, where this thing will machine right here. This is the wire, it's just like we saw before. And this thing here, of course, goes from the uh, supply spool to the take-up spool. But what you can do here is you can move it in the X, the Y direction, the Z direction, and you can also give it a slant. Right? So this is kind of like your XY stage to move this piece of wire to your workpiece. So this is then numerical controlled wire cutting, right? Uh, it's used specifically for plastic molders, and wire EDM has become very common in tool and die shops. Shape accuracy, that's, look at these numbers, and it depends on the temperature control. If you can control the temperature, let's say, to within three degrees C, uh, you have an accuracy of about four microns. If you can go to one degree C, you can bring that obtainable accuracy to one micrometer. That's pretty remarkable. Uh, the second bullet point is also very important. In this kind of machining, you don't get any burring. Who knows what, what burrs are? If you normally machine on something, right, you have a burr, it's a, a rim basically of metal that you then need to remove separately. And that, that's one of the expensive steps, right, because it's tertiary machining. With this technique, you don't have any burrs. So your surfaces and edges remain clean. Very important aspect. And something I pointed out, maybe the more important aspect of wire cutting is you don't need a tool, right? Because the tool is in your computer. It tells you how to move the wire, and you make the shape that you have programmed in your CAD uh, software. So pieces of over 60 inch, 16, can be machined, and tools and parts are machined after heat treatment, so dimensional accuracy is held and not affected by heat treatment distortion afterwards. So let's look at an example. It's an example I briefly showed last time. Uh, of course, this is not in industry. This is in a research setting uh, uh, in academia, uh, showing, kind of showing off, look what I can do the ultimate in CN wire CNC machining. So this pagoda was cut with that machine head you saw a moment ago, right? With the wire here all the way at the bottom. And then this was cut out uh, in the form of a pagoda. And the pagoda is 1.25 millimeters by 1.7 millimeters. That's pretty amazing, right? Truly 3D wire cutting EDM. Okay, making a big switch. While I'm doing this switch, you can ask me questions. So after the lithography class, we'll go back to laser machining. But as I told you, I need to introduce some equations 
in the lithography class that we need to develop and get you a better understanding of how laser machining works. So, any question on EDM? Quiet class. Okay, so how many people know about lithography? Raise your hand, because I see at least in the audience quite a few. Raise your hand high so that I kind of... Some of you hold it so low like you're embarrassed because you probably think if I say I know lithography, he will keep on asking questions to me, <laughs> right? Okay, very high. Who does not know lithography at all? Very high. Much higher. Okay, it's worth going through it in detail. And those that know lithography already, well, it'll be a breeze, right? So lithography is the principal tool to make integrated circuitry, MEMS, nanotechnology devices, it actually all starts with lithography. You could almost say that anything today that uses silicon will have a, as a first process lithography. And the better people became at doing lithography, the smaller features they could make. And so what is involved? Well, on the top right there, you see a silicon wafer, and there's a pattern on there. We're going to be telling you, how do we create that pattern on that wafer? How do you metallize a wafer in certain patterns? How do we oxidize it only there and nowhere else? Because in a way, that's what it's about. We have that wafer. First, it's just all plain silicon. But I'm going to end up, after the lithography, maybe 20 times, 20 lithography steps, I will end up with thousands of CMOS transistors, chips. I shouldn't say CMOS transistors because there's many, many millions in one CMOS chip. But I have thousands of CMOS chips with millions of transistors on it. Talk about batch. Right? So I do think that any engineer, depending on what type of engineer, should know this process, the lithography, because it leads to so many innovations. Not only integrated circuitry, but nanotechnology in MEMS is all based on understanding what is lithography. By the way, about the word lithography, uh, lithos is stone in Greek, and graphene means writing, so the word in a way means writing on stone. But we're not going to write on stone, we're going to write on silicon. And it's basically about writing, but we're going to write with light. Because our tools in the mechanical world are too rough to go into the domain we're going to be working in now. We're going to write with light. We're going to show you how to make the light writing the smallest possible features, perhaps as small as two nanometers. So what is covered? First of all, a simple definition of lithography. Second bullet point, resist tone. That's going to be a very easy slide. There's two tones in resist, high and low. You're looking at me. You think high and low tone? No, positive and negative resist, right? <laughs> and you got me there. <laughs> so then we're going to do an introduction of the whole process sequence, surface preparation, photoresist application, soft bake, align and expose, develop hard bake, etc. It's a long list, isn't it? But actually, you will see it is so logical, you will never forget it after this class. Okay? So we're going to introduce you to lithography. We start with the definition. So photolithography is used to produce 2.5D images. Need to explain this already. Why do I say 2.5D? It's something I alluded to in an earlier class. You remember we were kind of categorizing manufacturing techniques, right? We said some of them are truly 3D. Uh, talking about a contact lens, for example. But here we're saying 2.5D. You know why? Because in lithography, we will be having a lot of freedom in the XY direction to make all kinds of shapes, but not in the Z direction. The Z direction will be mostly a straight wall, or a wall like this or like that, but that's a detail. You can't do much on the sides. But in the XY plane, you will see we can write pretty much everything we want. That's why we call it 2.5D, because we don't really control the third dimension, the Z axis, as well as we control the XY axis. Good? So, using light, we image 
in a sensitive photoresist, and we have a controlled exposure of light onto that photoresist. Microlithography then is to do lithography at a very small scale. Okay, so we got the definition. Here it shows that the photolithography is so central in integrated circuitry. No photolithography, no ICs, right? And so every time you have progress in photolithography, we make better computers, we make better chips. I will end this class by alluding to something you all have heard about, Moore's Law. Moore's Law is basically founded in the fact that lithography keeps on improving, and because better lithography gives you smaller wine, line widths, I was going to say wine widths, <laughs> that exists too actually, <laughs> line widths that are narrower, makes it possible to cramming more transistors per centimeter square. That pretty much doubles every 18 months, except lately we are running out of steam because it's becoming too difficult, you know, at 10 nanometer, 5 nanometer, you start getting quantum effects, you start getting leakage. So we're hitting a wall. So we hope some of you will come up with, how do I go beyond Moore's law? Very, very important discussion you will always hear when we talk about lithography, photolithography. Okay, what I was telling you was next is resist tone. So there's two tones, right? There's a positive tone and a negative tone. So what you're looking at here in the top cartoon, so I have a substrate, and let's say it's silicon. I'm going to cover that substrate in some means, I'm not telling you yet how, with a sensitive polymer. It's called a photoresist. That layer will be, let's say, between one micron, but for certain applications, 300 microns. That material, photoresist, is light sensitive. But it comes in two variations. In the case of a negative photoresist, so, I have covered this here with a negative photoresist, and I'm shining light on it. What the light will do is make the photoresist harder. You will not be able to dissolve it anymore. It's like a paint. To remember how negative photoresist works, think about the paint. You paint a wall, it dries, there's light on it, it's less soluble than when you just put it on. Positive photoresist is just the opposite. If I have a positive photoresist here, I shine light on it, it becomes more soluble. Why is that? Well, because in the case of negative photoresist, the polymer chains are cross-linking more, making it less soluble. Whereas with positive resist, these long chains have broken up and making it more soluble. What that will allow us to do, if I now have a, a thing, and that thing is called a mask, where I shine light through it so that the light can cover this part of the photoresist, but not that part of the photoresist, one part will become more soluble, the other one less. I will put it in a solvent and I will have a pattern. But I'm running ahead, right? So for now, all you need to know, positive and negative photoresist, one becomes more cross-linked as you shine light on it, less soluble, that's negative. Positive photoresist, just the opposite. Positive photoresist, where the light has struck it, becomes more soluble. But now, how do I pattern? the wafer. How do I give it structure? That's with the mask. And that's going to be next. Here we go. So what I'm showing here, and I believe that it was Tuesday, right? We gave you one of these masks around. What you had was that plate there, a quartz plate. And you can see in this case what I have done. I have on the quartz plate in the middle, that darker area is chromium. So there's a metal there. So now I have silicon substrate, I have silicon dioxide, and a photoresist, a layer. I'm now shining light over the whole mask, and you can see the light can, of course, not penetrate through the chromium, so it will only cover, only go through and hit the photoresist in the rims around this. Now, without looking, if that is a negative photoresist, what will I have after developing? How will it look like? Mm, very hard. Okay. Very hard for the hole. It will be a hard rim, mm -hmm. right? And I have a hole in the middle. Yeah. Hmm? So if I now switch this to positive photoresist, what would I have? What would the result be? I would have just a square in the middle, right? 
And so, of course, I applied this to a big, simple structure. In reality, we will have these holes and closed-off areas extremely close together, as close together as I was talking about, maybe three nanometer. And that will allow us to create these patterns in the photoresist. So this is positive lithography. But what I've done here, to get the same result, I switched the mask as well, right? Because in this case, the mask is transparent in the middle, and the rim is dark. So therefore, although I switched the positive photoresist, I switched the pattern on the mask as well. So do we all understand very roughly negative resist, positive resist, and what actually it does to the polymer? So it's a way to give structure to polymer, right? I didn't sit there and machine these grooves, right? I also didn't need to do it chip by chip. It was in batch, it was in parallel. That whole wafer could have millions of these structures. And I didn't need to cut them out one at a time. They were all cut out in batch. That is why I see technology has such a big advantage. Is there a penalty using one way or another? Say that again, is the way? Is there a penalty or like resolution if you make negative resist or positive resist? There's definitely a penalty. And in general, the negative photoresists will give you less resolution, except some very uh, late results in negative photoresists have become almost as good as positive resist. But resolution, traditionally, if you plotted, the best resolution would be from a positive photoresist. By the way, kind of picking up on that question, what do you think will control the resolution in photolithography? I know this is way ahead but I need to build up to that. And I just want to see if you guys would already have a little bit of an idea, what would I do to make smaller and smaller features in that resist? Uh, smaller changes. Smaller cha you're thinking about the photoresist. You're thinking about making a more sensitive photoresist. That's, that's an approach. Many people are following that. Uh, but think about the physics of the light at this point. Let's say, given photoresist, how could I make these features that I'm drawing smaller and smaller? Yes. A shorter wavelength, absolutely. We will see rule of thumb. The features you will draw will, be, will be about the same size of the wavelength of the light you're using. So if you use, let's say, 220 nanometer, and I'm being old fashioned here, by the way, because nowadays people can do like 10 times better. In other words, they use 220 nanometer, but they crea create features that are 22 nanometer. Yeah, but Keep as rule of thumb now, what I will be writing, size-wise, will be about the same size as the wavelength of the light. Okay, it's a good rule of thumb to have. Nowadays, we have gone so much better, and research labs all around the world are actually trying to fiddle with, let's say, 192 nanometer, and cranking by all kinds of optical tricks, cranking up all type of technologies to still write features that are, let's say, 15 or 10 nanometer. And this is really, if you think about it, a tremendous engineering feat. I don't think I will have too much time to come back to it in this class, but do remember that a lot of things you're reading about integrated circuitry, it has to do with this. How do I crank more out of light, more resolution, without reducing the lambda much further? Because going much further below 192 nanometer, we have to go to soft x-rays. There's no lenses. Everything becomes extremely expensive. And that's kind of what the world is waiting for. Who has enough billions of dollars to create the next wave of exposure stations? Hmm? You, if some of you might have heard that the clean room nowadays costs several billion dollars. So there's today actually few countries that can afford to get into this game. It has become that expensive. That's, by the way, why I think these bottom-up nanotechnologies really deserve attention. Because if instead of going top-down with big machines, we can grow transistors from a beaker, it would be so much less expensive, right? So that's kind of one of the dreams. But I'm deviating. So what do we know about lithography so far? We know it's 2.5D. We know positive and negative photoresist. And we know about how a mask is made. So by the way, do you have a feeling why that mask was made out of quartz? Why didn't I make it out of glass? You know? UV 
and we are using UV, right? Because you heard we want to make the wavelength shorter and shorter. UV will be absorbed quite strongly by glass. Quartz has quite a nice window to let UV through. Eventually, I will also ask you, but how do you put the chromium on the photo mask? Because you would have to find a technique that has higher resolution to make the mask that you then use for photolithography. So keep that in, in your mind already. It's the same question as an EDM, right? I'm going to make a very small feature, but how do I make my tool? You have to have a machining technique that's always better to make your mold or your tool or your mask than what you're going to be making, isn't it? So keep that in mind. That might be a good question for a final. What are the machining techniques available for tool making in X, Y, and Z? They always will have to be better than the technique itself, isn't it? Suppose I use EDM tools to do EDM. <laughs> Not very effective, right? You would want to find a technique that's better. The same will be true for photolithography. We need to find a technique that's better to make the photo mask than the actual devices. So what we are doing here is now going all over all the steps that we're going to encounter. So I'm going to have my silicon wafer, going to do some surface treatment, I'm going to spin out a photoresist, that's photoresist application, I'm going to bake it a little bit. This is a little bit like a cooking lesson, by the way. If you're patient and a good cook, you might become a very good lithography person. You also have to be very patient, isn't it? <laughs> Fourth point, we're going to do alignment and expose. Alignment will mean, you remember I have that mask, right? And I'm going to project an image on the photoresist. Well, the first time, it's easy enough, right? I just project. But say I have three or four layers, these all need to be aligned, right? The features on there need to correspond. So that's a very important step. Alignment and then exposing, blast the light on it. We do hard bake, so we do development. That means all of the stuff that's more soluble gets removed. I do a hard bake so that the remaining resist is more res is stronger for the next steps, which might involve metallization, etching, etc. Do an inspection after the hard bake, etching number eight, resist stripping, and then a final inspection. Some processes may include a post-exposure bake. I will come to that once I reach step four. So are we on board? Let's go through each of the steps. It starts with you getting a wafer, a silicon wafer. You're going to buy one, and then the best thing is not to touch that thing. Because if you touch that wafer, you probably screwed it up already. It's also very good to use it rather fast, because typically these wafers will come in, they will be extremely nicely polished on one side, not on the opposite side, because it would be too expensive. You're only going to use the front side of that wafer. And it comes with oxide. And slowly that oxide, and this is something you should know, silicon dioxide, as you know, is an insulator. Of course, if you have silicon, there will always be oxide on the outside surface, right? So that oxide will have the tendency to slowly pick up water. It will hydrate. And what that will do for you is this. Your wafer becomes more and more hydrophilic over time. How do you test that? Well, I can tell you if the wafer has just come in, shipped, you put a drop of water on it, the water will boil up. It will be quite hydrophobic. But as time goes on, you will see you put a drop of water on it, the water will spread. It has become more and more hydrophilic. That's bad. Why? Because I'm going to put that photoresist on there. Photoresist is organic. It's an organic polymer. So if I happen to have a wafer that's old and aged, that oxide will be hydrated and the photoresist will not stick to it anymore. And you will run into problems. So if that occurs, you need to heat the wafer to remove the water that's on the top surface, and then you do a treatment which is called HMDS, hexamethyl disalazine. Hold on. Can you pronounce that for me? I'm going to try again. Hexamethyl disalazine. That was pretty good, right? Okay. So what is it? It's basically an organic molecule, I will show the form in a moment, that will react with that water, the OH, and make it such that metal groups, organic groups, are sticking out. So it will make the surface hydrophobic again. So you will actually nicely see before and after, after this treatment with HMDS, which you do at about 200 to 250 degrees C, 
for 60 seconds, a minute, the droplet will become all balled up again. The surface now is ready to accept the photoresist. By the way, you wouldn't have to do this if you had used the wafer immediately, because the wafers typically come pretty hydrophobic to begin with. Hmm? So a dehydration bake in an enclosed chamber with an exhaust, clean and dry the wafer's uh, surface, and hopefully it's already hydrophobic. If not, you treat it with HMDS, surface preparation. That's to make sure that your photoresist, which is our photosensitive polymer layer, will stick very well to the surface. This shows in a little bit more detail what happens. This is the HMDS, and when it sees a water molecule, it splits up like this, and you end up with ammonia that leaves the surface, and this here, the siloxane group, is bonded to the surface, and these metal groups are sticking out. And that makes the surface now from an OH-covered one to something that has all of these metal groups sticking out. Hmm? I think the next slide shows this a bit better. Eh? On the top view graph, OH is sticking out, hydrophilic water droplet smears out. I have done the treatment with HMDS at 200 degrees C. Ammonia has been pulled off, and now, look, I have all of these nice big metal groups sticking out, and the contact angle becomes much higher, so I can do the next step, which is the deposition of my photosensitive layer. How do you do that? You have a vacuum pump and a chuck with a hole in the middle there, and you put your wafer on that chuck. It gets pulled onto that chuck, and now you start spinning it. Why do you spin it? You spin it such that the photoresist liquid that you put on it is nicely spreading out, so that you have a very nice uniform film. If you look into any clean room, the dirtiest place in the clean room will be this station, because this thing will splatter, right? So you will always see somewhere in a dirty corner, you will see some thing with a plastic cover. You can be pretty sure that's where they do the photoresist deposition. Hmm? So you dispense, let's say, five milliliters from a bottle. One thing that often happens when someone has never dealt yet with photoresist, they take the bottle and they check her. Huh, let me go outside and ask someone, is this the right bottle? Should you do that? Oh. We do this process in a clean room that's also yellow. Yellow light. Why yellow? Well, yellow energy, sorry, wavelength, yellow, is a long wavelength, not enough energy to develop the photoresist. If you come with out with that bottle and you show it in white light, it's gone, it's over, game over. Right, so you keep that bottle, and you, it's a dark bottle, you keep it in the yellow room. You dispense five milliliters of it, do first a slow spin, about 500 rounds per minute, and then ramp up to 3,000 to 5,000 RPM. And so the quality measures is how long you do this, the speed, thickness, uniform, uniformity, particles and defects. Can you imagine that Everything we know in terms of electronics around us, in a way, depends on how good chemical engineers have learned to do this. You know, if your first job, if you would go into becoming a process engineer, it might well be, we have this new photoresist in the clean room. You have to work out what it would take in terms of time, speed, to always get a thickness of 1.2 microns. Because if you have a slight variation from wafer to wafer, your yield of that IC process you're making might fall down the drain. So how such a simple little process can control everything, it's pretty amazing. Eh? And so you also don't want to have it such that the film is thicker at the edges, because if the film is thicker, all the lithography you will do afterwards will be different than in the middle. So this film needs to be uniform all over. And then the worst that can happen, your hair falls on it, right? You have a whole hairline of transistors lost, right? So. Okay, so let's say we're making it one or two microns thick. And so that thickness will be dependent on omega, which is 
the RPM, how fast you spin this thing, the original concentration of the photoresist, and then the viscosity. And these factors here are the ones that that chemical engineer needs to establish because they're constants that will be different from resist to resist, including this K, this constant here. But once you know that, you have established K, beta, gamma, and alpha, you can predict what T, the thickness, would be if you spin it at a certain rate with a given resist. Yeah, so spin speed, solution concentration, molecular weight measured by intrinsic viscosity. Okay? And then these various exponential factors have to be determined experimentally. So we are on track. We have our wafer covered with a nicely uniform photoresist of one micron. Next thing, when I did that, you remember I took it out of a bottle, so there's still a lot of solvent left. So I do something called a soft bake. So I take that wafer with the photoresist, and in the soft bake what it happens is the extra solvent is being evaporated. Right? Simple enough. So partial evaporation of photoresist solvents, it improves the adhesion of the photoresist to the silicon. Improves uniformity, improves edge resistance, line width control. Again, almost everything is dependent on that. I know some of my students and probably others have worked with a photoresist, one kind of fo called SU8. It's a photoresist originally developed by IBM. Every student actually during that's working with that material during their PhD thesis will suddenly lose control. They say, for three weeks, this SU8 is not working anymore. And it's simple things like this. The exact soft bake, the pretreatment of the silicon. This is an area where the more detailed you are, the more chances you have of success. You have to be a very, very patient person to do lithography correctly. Any little detail will matter. Hmm? So we have now a polymer film that's a little bit more adherent, a little bit stronger after the soft bake. Now comes the biggest step, in a way the most important step. Well, they're all important because it's kind of, they all depend on each other, right? I bring my wafer to the exposure station. So what I have here is you, your UV light source. And by the way, how you will recognize that in the clean room. And for those that visit the clean room already, you will see the binoculars. And you will see a person patiently working with some micrometer, aligning that mask to the wafer. As I told you already, the first time, the first exposure is not so critical, right? You really have nothing to align to. But we're going to do photolithography up to 22 times, maybe 30 times. And each layer needs to be registered to the previous one. And that's why you need this very, very nice positioning alignment station. These alignment stations can be very expensive. Some stations where, for example, you want to align features from the top of the wafer to the bottom of the wafer. Think about the challenge engineering-wise. How can you do that? Right? You have a feature on the front side of two microns, and at the bottom, you can't see through the wafer, right? A feature of five microns needs to make a cross with that feature. We have such system. It's called a Zeus mask aligner. Think about how they do that. Very, very neat technology. But so here it's simpler. We are just looking at one side of the wafer. We are projecting the image on the mask into the photoresist. So we transfer the mask image to the resist-coated wafer. So on that mask, what do you have? Well, if it's for an IC, it will be all lines, spaces, squares, rectangles, etc. But it could be your grandmother's face. It could be anything, right? You can create that image. You're going to shine light through it, and you pattern it onto the photoresist. We are transferring the image on the mask onto that thin layer of photoresist. The light activates photosensitive components of the photoresist. And how does it work? Do you remember? In the case of positive photoresist, the light makes the polymer chains in shorter strain, uh, strains. And it can be easier dissolved. In the case of negative photoresist, it makes them connect better. It polarizes more, and it becomes less soluble. Right? Quality measures, in this case, line width resolution, overlay accuracy, the different masks, particles and defects. Don't spill hair on your wafer. What do we have now, actually? You know, if I would look at that 
resist, before and after. Would you, by eye, would you see a difference, you think? So here I have the wafer with monolithic photoresist. Now I take it out of the alignment station. Could you see a difference at this point? No. There's a latent image now. It means that photoresist has in it the potential of developing into a pattern. What do I need to do for that? I need to develop it. Just like old time days when people used silver photography. You had to develop it. Same thing here. Right? So here is the uh, alignment station. And you have to make sure that you don't make any errors. There's all type of alignment errors. Could be off in the XY, could be off in the Z axis, could be off at an angle. Mask aligner equipment and double sided alignment is especially important in micro machines. What do I mean with that? In integrated circuitry, you will only put your CMOS, your transistors, on one side. In MEMS and nanotechnology, we will make 3D shapes, and we often need both sides. So MEMS people will order wafers that are polished on both sides, more expensive. Integrated circuitry, for electronics, you only do one side, right? So, but for MEMS, nanotechnology, you need a mask aligner that can project an image on both sides of the wafer. What do we do next? Remember, so I have my image. What will I do? I will put it in a developer. What will that developer do? It will remove those parts of the resist that are more soluble. And as we know now, it will be the opposite for a negative photoresist than for a photo, uh, positive photoresist, right? Before showing you the developer, we are now leading into some equations, and it's these equations I need for laser machining. So this is the only little bit of physics in this class. The rest is kind of all descriptive, isn't it? The position of your mask, okay, I'm gonna say this is my mask, and my wafer. You can have three different kind of positions. One is, it's sitting on the resist on the silicon. That is called contact alignment. So you can see my mask is sitting directly on the photoresist. Number two, proximity. It's kind of simple, isn't it? So proximity, about 10 to 20 microns away. 10 to 20 microns away from the photoresist. Three, here's my mask, here's the photoresist, in between is a lens. That one is projection aligner. Which one of these three is your instinct will give you the smallest feature sizes. Okay, let me do it in two steps. Between these two, contact and proximity aligner, which one will give you the best resolution? Contact. contact. Eh? Because as soon as you have a gap, the light can spread more, right? You have more diffraction. But why would you want to do proximity anyways rather than contact? A very simple reason. If you have contact, you very quickly lose your mask, right? Because it literally sit and you might damage your photoresist on the wafer. But us poor people in academics, we often end up using contact because indeed it's very good resolution. And we are not after yields, right? We are after some research results. So we often use contact alignment. Now projection aligner is what the whole industry is using. All the equations we will develop for laser machining and photolithography, it's really the only equation that's important. Now, what is that equation? I'm going to tell it already to you. It's very simple. R, resolution, will be equal to, write it down, K, a constant, multiplied by the ratio of lambda over Na. OK, what is that beast? Let's analyze what that beast is, right? Resolution, K, multiplied by the ratio of lambda over Na. Lambda will be what? Wavelength of the light. And we already see R, resolution, it will get a smaller and smaller number as lambda gets smaller and smaller, right? Now, what is Na? Do you remember something of optics? Is it non-available? 
You were right. Say it again. It's the numerical aperture. And so what you actually will want, what do you want with NA? NA should be small or large? large. Very large, right? What that will translate into is huge lenses, very, very big lenses. So it can capture, because what happens in diffraction, the light spreads out like that, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like when a wave hits a hole in a dam. After it goes through the dam, it spreads out, right? Same here. If I want to capture that water or the light coming through that hole, that pinhole in my mask, the light goes like this. So what does that mean for your lens? It needs to be very, very large. That's one of the reasons why these optics are becoming more and more expensive, because we want to improve numerical aperture. We need bigger and bigger lenses to make that R, as we know today, better than 22 nanometers, even though we use 192 nanometers input wavelength. Pretty amazing, eh? A lot of engineering in that. So summarizing, we have contact printing, proximity printing, and self-aligned. Self-aligned, I have not explained yet, so circle that, because I need to come back to that. Fourth one is projection printing, and so this is the equation I was just giving you in a little bit more detail. I'm saying that the K in this case is 0.6, lambda over Na. What I have shown there, our resolution is two times beta minimum. Why, is, why two beta minimum? Well, look at how you would test the resolution accuracy of your photolithography system. You're going to take a grading, and you're going to have a whole bunch of grading with finer and finer grading strips. Right? So the grading is shown on top there. And B is an open space, and then I have B, metal, open, metal. And what I'm doing is making that B smaller and smaller and check on my photoresist how long can I develop it, how long can I project a fid high fidelity print of that grating. And so you can see this is the image that I get on my wafer. So it has already been distorted, right? Because as it gets smaller and smaller, you get more and more diffraction. If you want perfect fidelity, what you should have there is that rectangle. You see the rectangle? That would be ideal. But as you go smaller and smaller, your image starts distorting, and instead you have a wobble, right? Because of diffraction. And so what you want to do is you want to tell the user with this station, this aligner, the optimal 2B, so an opening and a, a closed strip that I can project with high fidelity is two beta minimum, right? And so that will be given roughly by 0.6 lambda over Na, good? So remember the self-aligned, I need to come back to that. Going yet a little bit deeper into the material I have presented so far, I now need to come to something, a concept that's actually a little bit more sophisticated than what we dealt with so far. It's called depth of focus. Now, anyone who's a camera person knows immediately what depth of focus is, right? If I want to make a picture of something up front here in great detail, but I don't have a high resolution far out there, my depth of focus is very shallow. If I want to go all the way to the end of the auditorium and have everyone sharp in the, in the picture, I need to have a very good, large depth of focus. Now, the perversion of this depth of focus is this. Whenever you improve R, the resolution, depth of focus gets worse. That's miserable, right? Because what will happen? Let's say I have a photoresist layer of three microns, and my depth of focus is only one micron. What will happen? It will mean that my fidelity, my image, is only projected correctly over one micron in the photoresist. It doesn't even go to the bottom of that photoresist. So your depth of focus needs to be always larger than the height of your photoresist. Right? So let's look into some equations. So the defocus tolerance or depth of focus. So in your mind, consider depth of focus the capability of a machine 
to project an image over a certain depth. And I already told you, if the resolution is very high, that depth will be very, very shallow. Hmm? If you want to project something over a big depth, so you need a big depth of focus, your resolution will not be so good. And you can recognize that from the equation up there. Look, it says K2, different from my K1 I have for R, right? R, you have written that down. You write K1 is lambda over Na. Depth of focus is K2 lambda over Na square. Now look at that. What happens with depth of focus if lambda becomes smaller? What will happen? Depth of focus becomes smaller. We, want, we don't want that, right? We would like, especially if we want to build high structures, we want depth of focus to be tall, large. Look what happens with numerical aperture. If numerical aperture becomes larger, depth of focus becomes smaller. So everything I do to improve resolution damages my depth of focus. Why is that such a big problem? Well, it's not a big problem for the integrated circuit people because their chips are like Holland. They're very flat. They're the Netherlands. There's no mountains. So I can project easily a sharp, high-resolution image. But in MEMS micromachining, we will have a structure here, 2 microns, 10 microns, 4 microns, 1 micron. How will I project a high-resolution image on that? You cannot. It's fundamentally impossible with this technology. Do you, are you understanding this? Connection between resolution and depth of focus. Very, very important. And so remember these two simple equations for projection lithography. Resolution is given us resolution. Resolution is equation, right? Help your friend. Lambda over an A multiplied by K1. Depth of focus. K2 lambda over Na square. So you make R very small. It gives you a big depth of focus. Right? Did I say that right? Wait a minute. I said it wrong, I think, right? Yeah. I said it wrong. So, thank you. You're all paying attention. <laughs> Do it again. So if my R, my resolution, you want that to be a small number, right? Mm -hmm. Depth of focus, you want to be a big number. Okay, and so if R resolution is a very small number, your depth of focus is a big number. So they fight, right? Anything you do to improve resolution hurts your depth of focus. A very important concept. So you understand this bullet point here then, much bigger issue in miniaturization science than in ICs. Because in miniaturization science, we will need Colorado. We need big depth of focus because we will have different heights of features. Integrated circuitry, it's Holland, it's flat, right? Oh, and by the way, so the numerical aperture here, very important equation. Oh, let's pay attention to this a little bit. Look, Na is given by sinus theta maximum. Theta maximum is this acceptance angle of this lens with the diameter D. So you can see that if I want to make Na, I want to make theta max bigger, so that means D longer, bigger lens, right? But there's something missing in this equation. Do you know what? This equation is not complete. It says, write it down. Na is sinus theta max. You know you must have done some optics. There's something missing there. It's, I can't say it starts with because it's only one letter and then you know what it is. There's one in front of the sinus theta max, I need to put something there. What do I put there? The refractive index, N, needs to go there. Why is it not shown? Because N in air is one. one. Okay, you know what people are not doing in lithography, Intel, latest technology? You remember, we want to make the resolution better and better, right? Where does N NA go? What do, you, what do you want to do with NA to increase the resolution, improve the resolution? Oh. NA needs to be bigger, right? So what they have started doing is putting the lens and the mask and the whole thing in water. <laughs> Why? The refractive index, N in that case is 1.4. 
Can you imagine what engineering goes into that? This is a mask aligner underwater. This alignment is moving at tremendous speeds because the throughput for IC is tremendous. You cannot have any heating. You cannot have any water ripples. And that gap, you know, is 10, 20 microns. That takes some engineering. I've seen this, one of these stations in Holland where they're developing some of these machines. This might become one of the next generation lithography systems. Because remember, we are trying to milk more and more out of a constant lambda. Right? So if we have 192 nanometer, well, that's fixed, right? That lambda is a simple equation. There's not much more I can do, right? I have Na to play with and that constant, K1. They can do a lot with that, by the way. Yeah, but so one, so connect this in your notes to immersion lithography. That's what it's called. Immersion lithography, because they're immersing the lens and the whole system into water. So, this is kind of summarizing. I replaced uh, R resolution by W, but it doesn't matter, right? So we want to reduce K1, reduce lambda, and increase NA. Depth of focus decreases as lambda decreases. NA, depth of focus decreases as NA goes up, and decreases as K2 uh, decreases, right? So that's the summary. And understanding this battle between these two components in an optical system in lithography is very important. And when we discuss laser manufacturing, I will need those same equations. That's why I'm giving this class now. Oh, this is to give the photography uh, people in the audience some recognition here. So of these two, which one has high depth of focus? This one or this one? That's high depth of focus. High resolution. Highest resolution. This one, right? And shallow depth of focus. So if you forget, just think about these two images and you'll reconnect everything, right? You know that the resolution will be much better here, right? But I can't see very far. Just the opposite than what you have in the landscape picture. How this has evolved over time. So when photolithography started, people were using a lambda. Now, this is an application of what we just learned. They used a lambda of 43.6 nanometer. That was the G line of a mercury, la a mercury lamp. Now, you can see at that time, they also had a numerical aperture of 0.35. And you remember in the equation, it's Na square. So I end up with 3.5 microns depth of focus. So these people were happy because their photoresist thickness was typically one micron. And so they can easily cover with that depth of focus the whole one micron, right? No problem. But then as time went on, we are reducing lambda because we know we want to have better resolution. So we went to 365. Now my depth of focus is 1.2 micron. And then 248. 0.5 microns. Today, we're working with 192 nanometer. So depth of focus is even shallower. That is a big, big, big challenge for engineers to keep on projecting integrated circuitry over that whole silicon wafer. Because their depth of focus is that shallow. Right? So big issue. But we need to fall back in line. I gave you a little bit of more information on alignment and development is next, right? Because I now have that image in my photoresist, I need to develop it. So what you do is the same system, the dirty system you're talking about where you do the coating. Now you dispense a developer and the developer will make a distinction between irradiated parts and non-radiated parts, such that you end up now, your silicon wafer now looks very different. Suddenly there's islands that you couldn't see before, right? So the structures, in the case of negative photoresist that have seen the light, or islands, they remain, and the rest has been developed away. So soluble areas of photoresist are dissolved by developer chemical, and visible patterns appear on the wafer, so we get windows and islands. And again, you do quality measure, line resolution, uniformity, particles and defects. 
Next, six is hard bake. What is that? It's a hard bake. So before we had a soft bake, a hard bake is just a little bit higher temperature. And it's to make the photoresist even more adherent and strong enough so it can withstand the etching we will do next, the metal deposition, etc. Right? So evaporation remaining, photoresist, improve adhesion, higher temperature than soft bake. So it's five minutes to five. I see some of you guys are getting itchy to go. Can I go five more minutes? Are you okay? Yes? Oh, yeah, some of you have to go to class? Okay, so uh, let's stop it here. Announcement for next week. You all remember, on Monday, I need to finish off the class on additive manufacturing, right? Or did I do that? Did, okay, you guys have to help me out here. Did I finish the additive manufacturing? Okay. I'm getting Alzheimer's here. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to finish additive manufacturing and we're going to review all the material we've seen so far. So I hope I can finish in 20 minutes the rest of additive manufacturing class and then the rest of the time we will just go over all the material we have seen so far. Okay? And then on Tuesday we finish this class on Thursday, we do the laser machining, okay? Thank you.